Up until the early 90s, all tuna went into a can. The South Australian Fishermen's Cooperative, with the acronym of SAFCOL, were the principal canners until 1973, when Port Lincoln tuna processors became established, producing the John West brand. In Eden, the cannery was originally owned by the Green family, trading as Green Seas, who sold out to Kraft, and in turn, to Heinz, who were canning 30 tonne of tuna a day. As a young guy coming into the fishery and working in the cannery, it was just amazing. You know, you're sitting there and you've got 200 women and a young guy walking through, well, you can just hear the remarks. <laughs> And you walked out of there red-faced. <laughs> it was it was great. Uh, you know, everyone knew everyone, and you know, we saw people of uh, different religions, different um, ethnic groups. A lot of the women um, were very funny and witty, and did often make comments like that, and also taught me a lot of things because I came from the city and I was a little bit naive. I'd never worked in that environment before and um, some of them could be very risque, but in a good way, they made you laugh. They were never offensive. We Eden employed a lot of uh, Koori people, Aboriginals, and they worked in harmlessly. You know, it was just fantastic. And what I just remember something one day, just sitting there watching, and some of the, um, the elderly Aboriginal women were just sitting there looking across the table at their daughters who were playing up but weren't doing the right thing. And the stare was deadly. <laughs> as soon as the young girls or guys saw them, they were straight back into it. <laughs> nah, look, it was just fantastic. Yeah, when you look at the cannery and how did it all work so well, you know, like putting oil on wheels, you had your leaders there, the four ladies, and uh, they picked some from everyone. Some bitched and whined but they realised why you know we had to get so many tonne of uh, tuna through the place. Uh, we had to train people as well. They were always watching out for the ones that you know maybe weren't pulling their weight but most of the team, like, there were little groups of women along and they all helped each other and they all um, they used to talk all day but they used to work as fast as they talked. They were really good workers. And yeah look I just remember some of them there, and um, I think in my time there was about five or six, um, four ladies there, and, uh, and then later on they got foremen, but uh, yeah, those four ladies were the backbone. They, they held everything together. They got, there was no squeaking wheels. It was just oiled. It just ran beautifully and smooth. And They were more like your friends than your bosses, than your four ladies. They were really, really good women but they knew what they were talking about when they were showing me what to do. We had our exciting times down at the cannery, but that extended into our social time. You'd meet the same people at the pub, the club, the football match. It was just fantastic. And you know, it was boom time in Eden. You know, it was a real frontier town when I came in the early 70s to see all this and, you know, the, the, Friday nights at the pub, it was shoulder to shoulder. You could not get a place to eat. The place was booming. And there's a lot to be learned. A lot to be learned about having a purpose with a job. You know, a job might be as humble as you want, but there is so much more you take away than just a pay packet. The beginnings of the Australian tuna industry were largely due to the efforts of the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, commonly known as CSIRO, which was formed in 1926, and in particular to the efforts of one dedicated officer, Stanley Fowler. Without him, I don't think we would have had an introduction to the uh, tuna fishery. And Stanley, at his, at his time, was a real leader in trying to assess marine environment from an aircraft. Fowler was concerned that much of Australia's coastal and offshore waters had not been explored in a fisheries sense. 
with the cooperation of the RAAF between 1936 and 1946, he undertook aerial surveys of pelagic fish stocks. Over 10,000 photos were taken between Brisbane in the east and Shark Bay in the west, using an old and uncomfortable supermarine walrus aircraft. These aerial surveys proved that there was a large resource off the east coast at certain times of the year. In January 1937, George Bridge Hobart sent two fish to Stanley Fowler, who identified them as bluefin tuna. These were caught by Bridge on his classic fishing smack, Storm Bay, which was usually involved in catching barracuda with jig sticks. The first success at actually catching and canning tuna was made off southeastern Tasmania in 1938. The fish were caught on troll lines by Byrne Cuthbertson and crew in the trading catch Wirata and canned at IXL's jam factory in Hobart. Also in 1938, and under Fowler's direction, the CSIRO commissioned its first research vessel, the 70-foot Warine, which had been built at Williamstown. They were the first ones to attempt persaining off the east coast. Uh, it wasn't very successful. They, they did have a couple of successes with uh, mackerel various times, but uh, weather and the conditions and the net, um, just manhandling, it was just a, just a tough job. And so by the early 40s, um, on the same boat, they abandoned the netting side of things and they went to uh, uh, tuna poling, live bait, stuck a bait tank on the back, built of inch and a half timber, and, and off they went, um, racks over the stern, all the Japanese jigs, and et cetera. And what's fascinating when you read the report is that they, you know, they got off uh, somewhere off the east coast there, and uh, there was eight schools of tuna, and they, but they couldn't get the tuna to come to the boat. Uh, they were throwing bait and uh, they had the wrong sort of bait and the bait would die. What it, it really started to show that if you were going to go even polling, which seemed a simple thing, you, you, you had to have knowledge. And uh, in early, very early reports, this concept of getting the right knowledge was, was uh, uh, you could have the manpower, you could have the boat, but unless you had that of hands-on knowledge you're on a hiding to nothing. At the same time, the South Australian tuna resource was not going unnoticed, spurred on by the American big game fisherman and author Zane Gray. Gray was drawing worldwide attention to the potential of the great white shark as a game fish. He was also telling the Adelaide business elite about the Californian tuna canning success. This along with the survey work undertaken by Stanley Fowler, resulted in the Kangaroo Island Investigation Company being formed to assess the stock in South Australia. In anticipation, and with government support, a new tuna cannery was built in Port Lincoln, adjacent to the abattoir. In 1939, the former Tasmanian trading catch, Terra Lina, was chartered by the Kangaroo Island Company to search for tuna. Capable of carrying six ton in refrigeration, she sailed to Port Lincoln and on to Streaky Bay. But even though she was fitted with live bait tanks and all the gear for poling, she does not appear to have met with success. The Ketch Korwa, also from Tasmania, was fitted out for poling tuna at McFarlane's Boatyard in Adelaide. Linked in with this effort, the CSIRO's Warine was also in South Australian waters, accompanied by a seaplane for fish spotting. Warine unloaded half a ton of bluefin before departing. None of these larger vessels were successful, apparently due to the difficulty of catching live bait, another example of failure through lack of experience of the operators. It was left to some of the small local cutters such as Wayunga, seen here fishing for tuna using troll lines, to supply the cannery with enough product to undertake experimental canning. Further investigation went on hold when World War II intervened. 
and the three larger vessels were all taken over by the armed services. In coming years, the cannery was to turn its attention to canning herring, garfish and salmon to feed the military. While tuna research ceased, the stock did not go unnoticed. We would see these fish every year along the coast when we were seen trawling. And we would catch them on jigs just for fun. In the late 1940s, the Warren brothers in the Eden Star experimented in purse sending mackerel and tuna with limited success. Their net simply too weak to handle large catches of fish. Poor weather conditions were also another important factor. They caught 16 ton and 15 ton at various stages, but not in the quantities you needed to catch. Uh, so again, uh, it, it was just too hard.